Rush hour traffic, don't you just love it? If there is a stalled vehicle in the right lane causing a bit of congestion, you might want to avoid this route. The forecast, cloudy and windy and cold. Thanks a lot. I need you to process these. All of them. By Friday. Thanks. Oh, no ketchup. Awesome. Thanks for nothing. Thank you, sir. You're very welcome. Come on. Come on. Go, 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 go! Oh, thanks a lot. It's not like we need you to catch a pass or anything. Why are you thankful about that, Daddy? I was just being sarcastic, honey. What's sarcastic? Uh, it's what Daddy's like when he's in a bad mood. No, I... I am thankful. I'm thankful for a lot of things. Thankful for you, for one, and thankful for Mommy. God's been really good to us, taking care of us. Not so much of our football team, but he's taking really good care of us. Thank you, sweetie. For what? For reminding me. so easy to let the, the busyness of life and the demands on us to rob us of that attitude of thankfulness. And especially when things are challenging and difficult. It's so easy to lose sight of the amazing blessings that God has poured into our lives. So this morning, we're going to take some time to say thank you. Hey, with Bran and Evelyn and Dora and Caleb, we're going to say thank you to God for Benjamin. We're going to recognize that he is a, a wonderful gift from God that we all want to treasure and cherish. And because of that, we want the best for him. We want him to experience the best life possible. So this morning, we're going to read together a passage from the Bible that reminds us of what that best life looks like and what Benjamin needs us to do to help him to experience it. So if you've got our Bible, you can open it up into Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 1 through to 12, and Dora is going to read it for us. Thanks, Dora. Um, these are the commands, decrees, and the laws the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you crossing the Jordan that to possess so that you, your children, and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all the, his decrees and commands that I give you and so that you may enjoy a long life. Hear Israel and be careful to obey so that it may go well with you and that you may increase greatly in the land flowing with milk and honey, just as the, the Lord your God of ancestors promised you. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on your door frames of the houses and on your gates. When the Lord your God brings you into the land, he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you a land with large flourishing cities you did not build 
houses filled with all kinds of goods, things you did not provide, wells you did not dig, and vineyards and olive groves you did not plant. Then when you eat and you are satisfied, be careful that you do not forget the Lord who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Thank you very much, Dora. These verses were really important to the nation of Israel. They were the the last words of instruction from Moses to the people of Israel after he'd led them through the desert for 40 years and just before they stepped into their new land that God had promised to them. And verse 4 in particular is very important. It's called the Shema. From the Hebrew word meaning hear. And was the basic, their basic confession of faith. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. These words were used to open every Jewish service in the synagogue. It was memorized by many Jews and recited by them morning and evening. And it was the first scripture that Jewish children memorized. But of course today, we're not here today as members of the nation of Israel. We've not come to God through that same covenant. So we don't need to follow the rules and the laws and the commands that are part of this covenant that we've just read. It said, we come to God through a new covenant. When we celebrate communion together in just a, little, uh, a few minutes, then we'll remember that Jesus took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. This is a new agreement that we've come into with God. We come to God through our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Our Saviour who laid down His life for us. And so in a sense you could say this passage was not written for us. We must be careful not just to to take it and to wrench it out of context and say, well that's what God is saying to us. But despite all of that, these verses do remind us of some very important things about God that are still true today. And they tell us about some priorities for Benjamin and for each one of us. So the first thing I want us to see is that God has a good desire for us. God gave these commands to the nation of Israel, verse 2, so that you your children and their children after them may live, may enjoy long life. God gave these commands to bless Israel and their kids. He told them how to live so that they would enjoy their lives. He promised that if they obeyed their laws, then their lives would be great. They'd flourish and live long and abundant lives. Now let's get this really clear. Jesus' promise to his followers is quite different. This is what Jesus said in John chapter 16 verse 33. In this world you will have trouble. Following Jesus does not mean that you will be healthy, happy and wealthy. If Benjamin chooses one day to follow Jesus, this will not guarantee a prosperous and successful life as everybody in the world would recognise. Following Jesus often means it will be hated and rejected and ridiculed and ostracised and left out. It means that we will need to deny ourselves and give up on some of our ambitions And some of our plans. But Jesus did promise us. That if we put our trust in him. We will experience the best life possible. 
This is what Jesus said in John chapter 10, verse 10. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Not a guarantee of a long life of prosperity here on earth, but the best life possible. A quality of life that starts now and will go on forever in heaven. And this is God's desire for Benjamin. He loves him so much that he wants him, he wants the best for him. And it's God's desire for each of us. God loves each one of us. And he wants us to experience life in all its fullness. But what does that life look like? What is this life to the full that God wants for each one of us? Well, have a look at verse 2 again. It says, So that you, your children, and their children after them, may fear the Lord your God as long as you live. This is the defining characteristic of the good life that God wanted for Israel. More important than a life of wealth or health or security, it was a life of fearing God. Now that doesn't mean being terrified of God. It's not fear in that sense of the word. Rather it means having a a deep respect and reverence for God. To honour Him as our God. It means having a, a proper relationship with Him. Accepting Him as our Lord. That is Jesus' definition of life to the full. He said so in John chapter 17, verse 3. This is what Jesus said. This is eternal life. That they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. The blessed life is about knowing God as our Heavenly Father, and Jesus as our Saviour and Shepherd and friend. So this is God's good plan for Israel. This is our prayer for Benjamin and for each one of us. That we'd live a a good life. A God honouring life. A life that is lived in relationship with God. That's life to the full. But we may ask, well, what does that require? What standard do we need to reach in order to know God and to be in relationship with God? To be able to live every day in the knowledge of God's presence and His, and His care and His love. What, what demand does that make on us? Well, verse 5 tells us, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your strength. When someone asked Jesus what the most important command was in the whole of the law, he quoted this verse. He said that the first and greatest command is to love the one true and living God with all of your heart and mind and soul and strength. This is what a God-honouring life looks like. This is what it means to be in an intimate relationship with God. And the reason is because only a life that's lived in, in wholehearted, passionate, complete love for God fully reflects how amazing God is. God is so amazing that He deserves our everything. He deserves our whole hearts. And that is what should motivate us to follow His commands. Again, Jesus in John chapter 14 says, If you love me, you will obey what I command. 
It's love for God that leads us to want to obey what He wants for our lives. To follow His plans. To follow His guidance. To walk in His footsteps. To seek to put Him first in every aspect of our lives. It's not guilt or it's not fear. It's supposed to, lo- it's supposed to be love that motivates us. To passionately love and honour God with all of our emotions and thoughts and decisions and actions. To honour Him with everything that we are and have. But this will also have an impact how we treat other people. Jesus said the second greatest commandment is like the first and comes from it. And that second greatest commandment is to love your neighbour as yourself. If we wholeheartedly love God, then we will selflessly love those who have been created by God. Those who have been created to resemble His likeness and to reflect His glory. We can't love God if we don't love His people. So this is the good life that we're going to pray for Benjamin. That he'll care for others. That he'll respect them. He'll recognize their value. He'll reach out to them in compassion. And that he'll do this because he loves God with everything he is and has. But this kind of life doesn't come automatically. We don't automatically love God and love others. A new dad was so excited about the birth of his son that he was determined to follow all the rules to the letter. So as he left the maternity ward, taking his baby home for the first time, he asked one of the nurses, So tell me, nurse, what time will I wake up the little guy in the morning? Oops, my battery's about to die. Excuse excuse me. Not my battery, my laptop's battery. (laughs) Sorry. (coughs) Trying to catch it before it dies. Yeah. I think it's charging now. We, we all laugh at that story. Because we know it's unnecessary. Because kids don't lie in bed in loving consideration for their parents, do they? Kids, we know, act as the boss of their lives. When they're hungry, when they need changed, they demand attention. And some, like little Benjamin, demand a lot of attention every hour of the night sometimes. And as they grow up, they still see themselves as the centre of their world, don't they? I know that Benjamin looks so innocent and so perfect, especially when he's sleeping. But as Dora says, he's not, he's not. And neither are we. And so we have a responsibility to teach them. To teach them the importance of loving God and loving others. So God God told the people to take his commands and impress them on your children. To talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and, and when you get up. God's word, the Bible, is not something that's supposed to be kept for religious services or special occasions. Instead, it's supposed to be the the centre of family life. The subject of our conversations at our dinner dinner table. What you talk about when you go for a walk. The main influence in our lives. used to be that every family had a a big, huge family Bible. Do you remember seeing them? And you wrote in them uh, all the births and the marriages and all all the dates. And then it sat on a shelf. On a coffee table. Just sat there. Had no impact on how you lived. That's not what it's for. 
The commands that God gave us are to help us to live out this good life that he has planned for us. They are there so we can teach our kids how to love God and to love others. So God wants us to read our Bibles together. To think about it, to talk about it, to discuss it, to live it out. Together. This is Bran and Evelyn's responsibility for Benjamin. If they want him to live the best life, then they need to take time out of their busy lives to teach the Bible to Benjamin. And to let that truth infiltrate every aspect of their lives. But it's not just on them. It's not just their responsibility. It's all of ours too. As a community of faith, we need to be committed to do what we can to teach Benjamin God's word. To share with him about how, what God wants for his life. And to help him to live it out. This is why it's not just Bran and Evelyn who are here this morning expressing their dedication, their commitment. But it's all of us. But if we are going to do that for Benjamin, then we first of all need to teach ourselves. Look at verse 6. The verse that comes before verse 7. These commands that I give you today are to be put upon your hearts. We can't effectively teach Benjamin or other kids about what God wants for them if we don't have that truth in our hearts. We can't teach others if we're not teaching ourselves. We can't make disciples if we're not a disciple ourselves. And the problem is that we all have a tendency to forget. So we use calendars or reminders on our phone. In our house, every five minutes, a reminder goes off on somebody's phone and it won't mention who. It's not mine, though. Or we stick stuff up in our fridge. Or whatever, tie something on our finger, right on our hand, whatever we do, because we need to remember, because we always have a tendency to forget. And that's kind of like what God told the nation of Israel to do here. Look at verse 8. Retie them as symbols on your hands and, and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. Now, some of the Jews literally did this. They put parts of the Bible in little boxes called phylacteries and they bound them to their left arm and also to their forehead. They also placed a little passage, actually the passage that we read, in a little case and fixed it to the doorpost at the entrance of their home. I guess some of us do something very similar to that by putting Bible verses on our wall or as a bookmark in a book. Or have a little Christian symbol as jewellery round our necks. Or some of us have a screensaver on our phone or a laptop that reminds us of something about the Bible. And they're all great ways to constantly remind ourselves of what the Bible says because the Bible is so important. All scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness. It's so important. We need to be reminded about this. But fixing the Bible onto our arms or our forehead or our doorposts wasn't really what this was about. For many, this just turned into another way to show off how religious you were. Jesus condemned the Pharisees for doing exactly that. He said, everything they do is done for men to see. They make their phylacteries wide. They had a bigger box than, than others just to show how holy they were. But what was more important than having the Bible on their bodies was having God's word in their hearts. God wanted his words to sink deep into their very being so that it would impact what they thought and what they said and what they did. 
This is what changes our lives. It's not about having a Bible. It's not even about just reading it. Or sticking Bible verses around the place or having it on our fridge. It's about letting God's Word sink into our hearts. And change how we live. As Psalm 119 says, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. So this is our great responsibility. If we want Benjamin and the other kids around to learn God's truth and let it lead them into the life to the full, then we ourselves need to be learning God's word. Letting it impact our heart and change how we live. But you know, no matter how much we do that, it will never be enough if that's all we do. It will never have the desired effect. The people of Israel, they had needed something more than just God's commands. They needed God to step in and rescue them. That's what Moses called them to remember. Look at verse 10. Verse 10 to 12. When the Lord your God brings you into the land, be careful that you do not forget the Lord who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. God wanted his people to remember that they had been, when they had been trapped in slavery in Egypt, they did not free themselves through their determination or their efforts. They didn't just escape Egypt because they got good rules or they got really religious and that set them free. They needed to remember that they needed God to step in and deliver them. They needed God to rescue them. And that's the same for Benjamin and for each one of us. We don't just need education. We need salvation. No matter how much Bran and Evelyn or we as a church try to teach and share God's truth with Benjamin, that alone will not bring him into the good life that God has designed for him. Paul says in Romans chapter 3 verse 20, no one will be declared righteous in his sight by observing the law. Rather, through the law we become conscious of sin. None of us will get right with God through keeping the rules. Even if they're God's rules. No matter how much we try, no matter how much we read the Bible, that won't make us innocent before God. Instead, it will just show us how far short of God's standards we fall. It will point out all the ways that we don't love God and all the ways that we don't love others as ourselves. So like the people of Israel, we too need somebody to come and rescue us. We need someone to come and set us free. And the great news is that this is what Jesus came to do. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus perfectly lived out that life of love for God and for other people that we can't live. He was completely righteous before God. But on the cross, he graciously took our messed up record and took the punishment that we deserved so that we could receive his perfect record and live the life that he deserved. And so if we put our faith in him, if we admit that we'll never be good enough on our own, if we declare our faith in Jesus, that what he has done for us on the cross, if we ask Him to forgive us and to become the leader of our lives, then we will be rescued. We'll be saved. We'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit who will transform our lives. 
And we know that we will be safe in his hands forever. That's what we want for everyone here. That's what we want for Benjamin. This is our deepest desire for Benjamin. And for all of us. Because we believe that when Jesus said this, he was saying the truth. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now we can't choose for Benjamin to accept that today. There's nothing that we can do to guarantee that Benjamin will accept this. He needs to choose this himself. He needs to choose to trust in Jesus himself someday. But today this is our prayer. We're going to pray that Benjamin will trust in Jesus one day. And we're going to express our commitment to God and ask for his help to point him to Jesus. This day is our day when we express our commitment to do everything that we can to encourage Benjamin to come to Christ. So today, as we give thanks to God for Benjamin, this is what we're going to pray for. That he'd experience a good life. One that is God-honouring of loving God with all of his heart and soul and mind and strength and loving others as himself. And we're going to pray for God's help for us to fulfill our great responsibility as a church community to share God's truth with Benjamin so that we can point him to Jesus, our gracious Saviour, the only one that can rescue him. And bring him into God's family. So that he can live the best life possible.